You're listening to the Love Unplugged Podcast, episode 136. Are you ready to shatter the glass ceiling and step into your power? Then today's episode is for you. So learn how you can become a million dollar woman, how instrumental your habits are to your success, how to build confidence, and how to make sales feel sexy. It's all being covered today and my guest does not hold back. So without further ado, let's jump on in. Hey there, I'm your host, Jessica Fergon, and I am passionate about doing the inner work needed to reach your goals. Let me be your guide as we navigate all the fears and insecurities that surface when it's time to step outside of your comfort zone. Along with my knowledgeable guests and industry experts, I'm here to teach you how to reawaken your life purpose and passion and create the steps to turn your intentions into action. Ultimately, my goal is to empower you to rise above those blocks holding you back and start living a life that you are worthy and deserving of. So come on, it's time to slow down, find a comfy spot with your favorite organic tea, and get inspired. Thank you for tuning in to the Love Unplugged podcast. Hello loves, today I am joined by the lovely Jacqueline Rauke. Jacqueline is the founder and CEO of the JW Method, JW Consulting Inc., and Million Dollar Workspace. A chief success officer to the modern ambitious woman, she is helping women unapologetically shatter the glass ceiling. Jacqueline is an ex-corporate sales executive that soared up the corporate ladder by the age of 24 years old, cumulatively managing over $700 million combined in her career in capital markets on the trading floor and in private sector. Now running her own multi-six-figure advisory and consulting agency, Jack is on a mission to make you a million-dollar woman. Now, I must say that your branding alone is incredible. I absolutely love how you show up online in your community. You're such a powerhouse woman. Welcome, Jacqueline. I'm just so excited to have you as a guest. I'm so honored for you to take the time to join us today. But before we start, I'd love for you, for those that don't know you yet, I'd love for you to share a little bit more about you personally. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I am super, super excited to be here. So yeah, my name is Jacqueline Rilke, but you can call me Jack. Um, As you guys heard, I'm the founder and CEO of the JW Method and Million Dollar Workspace, Million Dollar Woman Workspace, whatever you want to call it. Uh, I was born and raised in Toronto, Canada, but I now live in the city that never sleeps, New York City, kind of fitting given for those of you who are entrepreneurs, you know that you don't sleep either. So it's the perfect place (laughs) to be as a young, ambitious woman on a to shatter the glass ceiling. Um, again, I started my career in capital markets on the trading floor, quite unconventionally rather. Um, I actually started on the trading floor before I graduated from university, um, which was super interesting. I'm sure we're going to dive into that in this interview. Uh, transitioned to private sector, ran a global sales team by the age of 23, uh, managed over $700 million in three short years of combined sales targets. Uh, and then I ended up launching my company, sponsoring myself for my visa into the United States, now living in New York City. So it has been a wild ride the last four years, let me tell you. But hey, as my old boss on the train floor used to say, pressure makes diamonds. So uh, we are just keep going as we were just talking earlier, Jessica, onward and upward from here. Absolutely. I love that. Pressure makes diamonds. (laughs) That's a good one. It's so funny. I went for lunch with her on the, or I went for lunch with her rather a few weeks ago. And I'm like, Rita, every time I'm struggling, I hear your voice in the back of my head saying, Jacqueline, sweetie, pressure makes diamonds. And I swear, guys, that keeps me going more than anything else. Mm, I love that so much. I'm definitely going to start saying that to myself and I'm going to hear your voice now. (laughs) (laughs) Love it. (laughs) All right. So let's start at the beginning. Prior to you having this business, what was this whole journey and like on the trading floor at 24 or like right out of university, like, or not even out of university? Like, what is that? Yeah. So I started working on the train floor when I was 21 years old. So I was literally in fourth year university and I was really determined to work in structured product sales. I didn't really know what that was, but for whatever reason, I was like, yep, 
like equities, like structured products, like the line of business, want to work there. So I networked the hell out of myself and basically would take the train in from Kitchener. I went to Wilfrid Laurie University in Toronto and then would take it into downtown Toronto and sit my butt in Brookfield Place, which is where the trading floor was that I worked on. And anyone who was willing to meet for coffee with me, I just networked, networked, networked. And when I was in my last semester, I had someone who reached out to me and was like, hey, we have this job that's available. We think you're a really great fit. I ended up interviewing for it. I literally ended up pitching myself in terms of why they should hire me with no experience. Like they wanted an MBA, five years of work experience. I had no years of work experience and not even my bachelor's degree yet. Ended up landing the job. So basically had to tell my professors, see you later. Got a job in trading floor on the trading floor in capital markets. Uh, and they literally like, we'll see you at final exams for your 51% to get your diploma. Like they were super supportive. So right off the bat, I was really thrown into uh, the highest and fastest paced corporate environment that you could ever think of, right? Like trading floor finance, it's, it's Wolf of Wall Street on steroids. And people think I'm over-exaggerating when I'm saying that, but I'm not. You're in a room with 400 people. You don't have desks. People are yelling. There's bells ringing. Like It is just such a immersive and expansive environment to work in. And I was given a third of Canada to cover at the age of 21. So I was not given a small mandate or an entry-level position. I was thrown in and it was sink or swim. And at the time that I started, my dad was battling stage four cancer. And it was such a pivotal time in my life because I was so determined to make a name for myself and really start on the right foot for my career and, and network and, and build myself as the woman that I wanted to be. And at the same time, I had this underlying driver and motivator, which was my super ambitious father who, you know, he's amazing. He was literally doing conference calls while he was getting chemo. And he was the one who literally was like driving me to be like, keep going. Like, you got this. Keep going. Right. Because it was always one of his dreams to be on the trading floor. Um, so I was on the trading floor for two years. Again, it was it was such an insane time. Obviously, an extremely male dominated industry, which I know we're going to get into. Um, but it, it taught me a lot about resilience and having thick skin, and you know, just being unapologetically you and ambitious. Um, then I got an opportunity that came my way, which was actually to go switch into private sector, and it was for a sales role. But the underlying tone was, "Hey, Jacqueline." you say you're amazing at sales, come show your worth and that you can actually do it. And if you can, we'll basically promote you to run the global sales team within six months. Sure enough, came in, did the JW effect and was promoted to director of global sales within six months within the company and was managing a sales team that the average age was double mine. So you can imagine the resistance as a young 23 year old coming in, who's this know it all that knows what she's doing and having to step into this managerial role very, very young in my career. Um, and then I ended up leaving that, that, that situation. Again, I'm a big believer of really staying true to your morals and ethics and values and never um, never discounting yours to make other people happy. So I decided to walk away from equity on the table, making a couple million by 25, 26, and was like, you know what, this is not for me. And I always say this is one very vivid, vivid, vivid moment um, where I was sitting in the Shangri-La in Toronto where we lived. We lived in the residences and we were on the 44th floor. So we hovered above all of these buildings in Toronto and we face west and you know the sun was rising and you could see the sun rising I was drinking my morning coffee and I was sitting there and I was like how did I get here I felt like I was like soaring so high and now I'm sitting here and I don't know what my next move is and it was like the universe hit me on the head and was like Jacqueline you didn't go through all this shit to not help women who are going through the same whether or not they're in corporate, they're in finance, they're entrepreneurs, like you have a wealth of knowledge that you have gained through your trials and tribulations over the last three years. So do something with it. And literally in that moment, the JW method was born. Wow. <laughs> That's a shit ton of experience in such a short period of time, but also for such a young age. Yeah, people always laugh. They're like, you're such an old soul. I'm like, I have no choice but to be. <laughs> yeah, you're kind of forced to like grow up pretty quickly there. Yeah, yeah. It was sink or swim, guys, for a lot of my early on career. But again, I 
I attribute the resilience that I now have to growing and scaling my business to seven figures. Um, and like, again, I have a big goal to make Forbes 30 under 30 for changing um, Gen Z and millennial retention of high performers in the workplace and in corporate and, and for large financial institutions. And at the end of the day, I wouldn't be able to do that and achieve those goals if it wasn't for the resilience I've gained through me having to mature and go through these experiences very young. Absolutely. Now let's talk about your experience being so young, being a woman in a male dominated industry. Like that's intimidating, but it's also like, how did you navigate that? Like, how did you not let it get you down? How did you continue to rise in that type of environment? Yeah. So being in the single most male dominated industry, arguably that there is, it taught me a lot very early on about knowing, again, your morals, your ethics, your boundaries, and having, again, that thick skin. Um, when you work in an environment like a training floor, where again, the ratio of men to women is just absurd, right? And they tell you, you know, drop your voice lower on conference calls, you'll be taken more seriously. Or like, I always share this guys, like I have big boobs and a big butt. Like I can't hide that, but I would feel like I would have to wear, like, I feel like I couldn't wear a pencil skirt and a bodysuit with a blazer because it was too provocative, even though anyone else could wear that. But like, just because I had boobs in the butt, it made me seem like I was unprofessional. So it really took a lot of having that thick skin and understanding at the end of the day, just because I am a woman, and I, you know, what I mean, like wearing my four inch stilettos and my pencil skirt, and I like wearing my makeup and taking care of myself, it doesn't make me any less. And I can tell you, when I first started, I didn't have the backbone and the confidence that I do now. Was I always extremely confident? Yes. If anyone on the train floor is listening to this, you're going to be like, what are you talking about, Jacqueline? You're always very confident. But I do remember that when I first started, I did feel like I had to wear the shoulder pads in my blazer. And I did feel like I had to wear the turtleneck and, and hide myself. And I did feel like that if I, you know, if I was too giddy or too bubbly, I wouldn't be taken seriously. Or on the flip side, if I was too serious or voiced my concerns, I would be called a bitch. And I always talk about this one pivotal moment. Um, so if you basically, when you, when you enter the trading floor, there is this big revolving bulletproof door that you have to go through. And, you know, when you walk in, again, it's a huge room of 400 people and there's almost these runways down the center of the room and there's three of them and of course my desk was right at the very end of this quote-unquote runway on the left hand side so everyone sees you when you walk into the trading floor and I'll never forget there was this one moment where you know I, I made a name for myself people know me as being the exceptional MLGIC structure product sales girl who traveled all over Canada and never said no to anything and was just like taking the world by storm. And I remember being like, you know what? Screw it. I'm wearing the skirt today. I'm wearing the heels. I'm bringing the Louis Vuitton in and like, I'm done playing it small. And when I woke, walked in that day, I'll never forget. One of my colleagues came up to me and I walked over and I put my Louis on the desk and I sat down and took off my jacket. And he came up to me and he was like, something's different about you. He's like, I don't know what changed, but he's like, keep doing it because he's like, I can tell you every single person on the floor can feel your energy right now. And it was when I kind of said, you know, enough's enough. I'm done shrinking myself smaller to make other people comfortable. And I can tell you that was the best decision I ever made because now being off the trading floor for two years, I'm able to go meet with the highest people on the trading floor because they remember me. And they remember me as the extremely confident young Jacqueline who wasn't afraid to take risks and wasn't afraid to shine so bright that people noticed her. And I can tell you to this day, it has been my biggest asset by deciding, you know what, enough's enough. I'm confident. I'm powerful. I'm unapologetic. I am, I'm, I am I'm ambitious and I am okay with being that person. And if it makes someone else uncomfortable, that is a them problem, not a you problem. And I can tell you that has transformed my business and my career more than anything else ever could have. I love that. Was there ever a situation where you had to stand your ground? You had to kind of not defend yourself, but like mm -hmm. 
just kind of put in your boundaries with anybody at work. Oh gosh, which one? All the time. <laughs> pick, pick the pick of the litter. No, like again, it's it's when you work in a male dominated industry and. A lot of men, unfortunately, in finance on the trading floor, they operate from a place of ego. This is why if my clients are operating from a place of ego, I will check them faster than anything because when you feel entitled or you feel like you deserve something because you're so egotistical, there were definitely times where I was like, this is absolutely not okay where I had to leave dinners or I had to like not respond to emails and block people and, and, you know, actually cut off connections that were people would probably think I'm crazy for doing so because they did cross the line. And I think again, when people operate from a place of ego, they don't realize that they're being arrogant and that they are crossing a line, nor do they see a problem with it. So there were many circumstances. And I think anyone who's listening, who, um, has been approached by someone who is egotistical or arrogant and thinks that they deserve something just because they're of status or power, you know exactly what I'm talking about. But what I will say is it took me a few times of letting it happen and realizing it wasn't okay before I had the backbone to be like, no, this is not okay. So if anyone's listening, they're like, I understand what you're saying, but like, I let it happen. Just know that like it's okay whenever you decide that you like have the confidence and the power to put your foot down. It's okay for you to change and make that decision. Absolutely. That's such great advice. Now, I know how JW Method came to be. Um, what was your experience starting and growing that business? Oh, it was it was never a dull moment. Let me just, just say that. You'll learn I'm very transparent. Um, I don't believe in keeping any cards off the table, especially on, on these interviews. Um, so when I started my business, I'm going to be fully transparent. It was a very interesting time of my life because my boyfriend, Austin, um, he was actually living in the UK. So he was working for an alternative asset firm. And they basically were like, hey, we're moving you to New York City to open um, the New York office. So I'm basically sitting there with this infant of a business and I didn't have any sales yet. It was just like the rough bones of the structure and basically me having to create a full business plan to get the hardest visa you can ever imagine getting to be, to get immigration to the States, which is the E2, um, substantial investor visa, and me having to basically bulk out and build this insane business plan proving that I'm contributing to the U.S. economy, hiring U.S. employees, where the minimum investment value is 100000 U.S. dollars. So I apparently have this recurring theme, as you guys can probably tell, where I'm just thrown into the fire and I have to sink or swim. Um, so that was literally how my, my business started, was with that kind of energy, where I was like, listen, I need to get my butt to New York City. I need this visa. The only way I'm going to get through this or get, you know, get on the other side is by going through it. So I just started hitting the ground running. I worked on building the solid foundation first. So making sure I had my legal ducks in a row, my financial ducks in a row, uh, making sure that again, what I was building was sustainable and I had that solid foundation. And then I call it a blessing and a curse that I had to invest that level of money. But uh, it really did fuel my business very early on. Now, what I will say is, and I'm very transparent about this, like, again, I come from finance. Um, I talk a lot about finances and the importance of knowing your numbers and uh, making smart decisions and investments that generate a pretty large ROI. But I was in the red, so in the negative in my business for the first six months, guys, because I had to make these investments. I had no choice, right? But I can mm -hmm. tell you, and I don't recommend that for anyone, please. Do, I do not recommend it for anyone that's listening to this. But what I will say is it taught me a lot about the online space because I talk a lot about the online space and how I think it's extremely negative. And I think uh, there's a lot of scare tactics involved and there's a lot of people who claim um, to provide a lot of value, but unfortunately don't. And I can tell you the lessons I learned very early on, I'm very happy that I did because it taught me to keep my cards close to my chest in the online space and to be very careful about who you trust and to invest very strategically. So it was sink or swim. I got burned quite a few times. I'm not even going to lie. 
Um, I learned a lot about people who I thought were credible and authentic and operated from integrity, but turned out they didn't. Um, So it was a very turmoil six months. Um, But again, I'm coming out on the other side of it. And um, I'm now realizing that the lessons that were being given to me were so that I could help other women again, not go through the same. Well, I love that you're strong enough to go through those things to teach us how to navigate it. Oh, girl, I could teach you a lot of things. Let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. All right. So let's see about habits. Um, what do you think have been instrumental to your success when it comes to creating habits and structure and rituals and whatnot to, to take care of yourself on a personal level to help you stay productive and efficient and whatnot? Yeah, so habits and routine are a cornerstone of the JW method only because I would not be where I am today if it was not for my habits and routine. So if you know me, if you've been following me for any degree of time or listen to any interview that I've done, my morning routine is my most sacred time. I don't take conference calls until 11 a.m. and that is for a very strategic reason. One, I operate the best in the morning. I'm my most productive. So why would I give away my power and my most productive hours to someone else before I invested in myself or my clients first? Secondly, my morning routine is really important for me to stay grounded, humbled, confident, and aligned. So I'm a big believer. So I wake up every single morning at a consistent time. I wake up, I make my coffee. And I always sit down with my AirPods in, like I'm a big music person, and I always open my journal and I'm very consistent about what I write. The the words that come out differ every day, but I always follow what I call like the 555 method. Oh my goodness, sorry to interrupt, it just started snowing in Canada. What is happening right now? (laughs) Why is it snowing? Oh my goodness. Oh, thank goodness I'm in Vancouver. (laughs) I would absolutely hate that. It's snowing, guys. Get me back to New York. Um, The the 555 method. Sorry. Small interlude. The 555 method. So this is basically where I always write down five things I want to release. Again, as ambitious women, we carry a lot of burden, a lot of stress, a lot of tension. And quite frankly, sometimes you wake up on the wrong side of the bed and just need to get these thoughts out of your head. So I'm a big believer of getting thoughts down on paper so you can move on with your day and not bring that negative energy into your client experience or into whatever you have on your agenda or even for yourself that day. From there, I immediately flip the script and write down five things I'm grateful for. These could be friends, family members, my team, my business, my body, my health. It could be absolutely whatever I feel grateful for that morning. And then what I always write down is five non-negotiables for the day. So these are things that if my day goes to shit, I do these, like I need to get these done by the time I go to bed. So these could be something like work out, drink four liters of water, um, finish client deliverables so you're not behind track, um, clean up finances, and pay your team. So five things that are not like earth shattering or would take up too much time. But if I got just those five things done... I would be happy with myself. And then I always write down three to five big picture long-term goals. People are like, Jacqueline, why do you do that? Well, if I'm writing that I'm going to make seven figures by 27, Forbes 30 under 30, and sign a $100,000 contract by the end of the year, and I write that every single morning, do you think I'm tricking my subconscious to believe that it's actually possible? Absolutely, I am. Um, So that's a habit that's a non-negotiable for me. I work out five days a week religiously. I drink four liters of water a day because I'm a big believer that when you look and feel your best, you shine differently, you glow differently, you attract differently. And when it comes to running your business, you are the face of your business. So I'm not Mm -hmm. saying you have to be on all the time, but by you prioritizing yourself physically, mentally, spiritually, and emotionally, you will show up 10 times better for your clients in a way that you could ever imagine. 
Same thing goes for like self-care and travel, right? Like I'm a big believer, like I get deep tissue massages every two weeks. Like I always make sure that I go and get facials done. My nighttime routine is just as rigorous as my daytime routine because again, if you're an entrepreneur or if you work in a fast-paced environment like the trading floor, so much of your day and life is uncertain. You know, you are responding to the market and other people and your clients. So you need to make sure that you have these habits and routines in place that are going to empower and instill confidence within yourself to be the best version of yourself. When you do that, you win. And when you win, you know your clients and everyone else around you does too. So for me, habits and routines are pivotal in becoming a million dollar woman and making sure that you are growing and scaling your business at the same time. Wow. That was like everything. (laughs) I could talk for hours about habits and routines. Like they are, that's like the, the, the one a Coles notes of why routines are important, but more of the story, if you do not have a morning routine, a nighttime routine or consistent habits that make you feel like a million bucks, let this be your sign to put some of those into your calendar this week. Absolutely. It makes all the difference. And I like, you just made me want to get a little bit more serious about my own routines. (laughs) I'm telling you, girl, your life will transform. Like clients always like, especially uh, clients come to me and some of them are kind of skeptical. Like they kind of look at you with a side eye, like really Jacqueline? And I'm like, do you trust me? They're like, well, yeah. I'm like, do it, do it for three months and come back and tell me how different you feel without fail, without fail. They're like, oh my God, Jacqueline, you were so right. I'm like, I told you so. Million dollar woman need million dollar routines. If you don't have a million dollar routine yet, you need to make one. Mm, I love that. All right, so let's talk about lessons. You've kind of given us a little bit of a peek into all of the stuff that you've experienced and you've learned from, but I'd love to know your the top lessons that you'd like to share with everybody listening today from everything that you've gone through in your career. Yeah, so my two biggest things for sure, and this applies if you're an entrepreneur or you're in corporate or if you're in finance. The first one, which I said earlier, is to keep your cards close to your chest. Um, I am a very trustworthy person. I choose to see the best in everyone. That's just who I am. However, I've learned very quickly that a lot of people do not have the, the same morals. And the amount of people who are willing to step on your head to get to the top are it's it's earth shattering and I think a lot of people um, pretend like they have your best interest in mind because they're curious to hear what you have going on behind the scenes Um, and I can tell you I've shared things with people and they actually have taken that and brought it to market and, and and branded it as their own before I was able to because I trusted them so this is all to say is keep your cards close to your chest And secondly, move in silence and let success be your noise. Again, I like to share. I am a giver. I am a communicator. And at the end of the day, I'm always a big believer that if I learn something that has helped me be successful, I want nothing more than to share that with my community and the women that I work with because, hey, if I can help, my goal is to make a thousand millennial millionaire women a year. Like That is my goal eventually, to make a thousand millennial Uh, millionaire women. And so for me, I love sharing what's going on and what the next move is and what I've learned from it and, you know, how I got there. But at the end of the day, again, a lot of people are just curious and they don't have your best interest in mind. And I think this goes the same with like hiring teams versus contractors. Like, again, I've learned that not everyone will care about your business as much as you do. And I think that that was kind of one of the biggest rude awakenings for me was, yes, your business is your baby. You want to grow it and scale it and you care about it like no other. But at the end of the day, no one else will care for your business as much as you do. And I think it's really up to you as the CEO of your business or you know, as the ambitious woman that you are to take accountability for your actions, good or bad. And if things aren't going good and you're not moving in silence and people are ripping you off – Hold yourself accountable to that versus like if things are going really good and you're like, okay, great, this actually worked out, success is your noise and people are asking you how you did it, also hold yourself accountable to share that with others. Um, I think a lot of people um, are quick to share the bad or call people out, but at the end of the day, 
Um, you will make a much bigger impact on the wor- world if you focus on sharing the good and focusing on the good that's happening and the good energy versus like being sucked into the negative energy, um, which we know a lot of that unfortunately exists within the online space. Absolutely. And I love that you mentioned like keep your your cards close to your chest because that's something that we kind of struggle with. I think a lot of people I've I've met have as well as I do where you kind of want to share everything that's kind of going on behind the scenes and what you're working on, but you have to be very careful with who who you're sharing that type of information with and you want to make sure that they are someone that is trustworthy that has the same values and and whatnot as you. Totally. Values, integrity. Mm-hmm. It's so important, guys. And again, I, I've i been very close to going into business and partnering with people. And the universe very fortunately showed me true colors before that happened. So just make sure like in any business decision that you're making, you give it at least three months before you jump in minimum. I say six months if you can, right? Like it's easy for people to hide their cards for a couple of months, but if you are able to continue conversations and and draw things out and really get serious and strategic, the stones will turn if you give enough time to do so. So just make sure that you're not jumping in Um, naively into business decisions or career decisions and make sure everything you're doing is rooted in strategy and integrity and you will you'll soar your way to a million dollars I can guarantee that that's such great advice so thank you so much for sharing that I know so many are going to benefit from hearing that Um, but I want to dive into how you support women now. So let's talk about how we can shatter that glass ceiling, as you say. You know, what is key to creating a successful business and taking it to that level? Yeah, so as I mentioned earlier, solid foundation and clarity first is super, super important. And then you can focus on scaling. When it comes to shattering the glass ceiling, it is really important that you understand the multi facets of your business in order to, to really take it to the shatter the glass ceiling level. So what do I mean by that? As a CEO of your company, it is your duty and obligation to be knowledgeable about all the different aspects of running your business. So you hear the term wearing many hats, and I do think it is really important. You should be knowledgeable enough to make CEO level decisions when it comes to your finances, your taxes and your accounting, your legal situation, your marketing strategy, your sales and revenue plan, your product suite your um, your over your branding um, and any other your operations, your systems, your automation, if you are not knowledgeable enough about making CEO level decisions on all the facets of your business, you need to educate yourself. I am a big believer in that you are the single most powerful asset that you have to shatter the glass ceiling. And the the biggest booster of your confidence will come from you educating yourself and being knowledgeable about your business. So if anyone asks you a question or if a client asks you a question or if you're on a console call and they ask you a question, you don't have to blink twice about the answer. And I think when people ask me about shattering the glass ceiling, confidence is, is number one. Like if you are not confident in who you are, what you bring to the table, what your pitch is, what you're selling, how you make an impact, the value that you bring to the table, you're not going to be successful. And I'm not going to sugarcoat it because there are 7 billion people in the world. And I'm sorry if you are not at that level where you can confidently stand in front of, let's say I'm meeting with the head of the trading floor on Thursday. He is a terrifying man but I'm confident enough to stand in front of him and pitch my value and my worth in terms of why he should hire me for a corporate consulting contract. That level of confidence is going to shatter the glass ceiling. So for me, it's confidence in knowing who you are and what you bring to the table. It's confidence in understanding every single facet of your business inside and out. But more importantly, it's understanding so deeply the value that you bring to the table. Because let's be real, guys, if you don't bring value to the table, you will not be at the table, period. And I think so many people try to 
um, cut corners or, you know, you hear people scale to six figures or scale to, you know, multi six figures, but they don't actually learn all the different areas that are going to help them help them get there faster. So know your value of what you bring to the table. And if you're not confident enough of the value you bring, educate yourself, hire a coach, hire a consultant, make an investment in your business that's going to generate a solid return on investment or ROI. Again, do your research. There's a lot of um, lack of better words, a lot of shady people in the online space where they, they are great at pitching and they're great at selling, but do your research. What are their credentials? Where is their business? What is their history and their experience? Because again, making these level of investments will help you shatter the glass ceiling faster. I always say you can get there on your own, but number one, why the hell would you want to? And two, why wouldn't you hire someone who can get you there 10 times faster? It's these levels of decisions and confidence that are going to help you shatter the glass ceiling. Absolutely. So you talked about confidence. So how do you build up that confidence in yourself? And then how do you make sales, which can often feel very kind of sleazy or like just kind of just, just doesn't sit right? How do you make them feel sexy and make them feel fun? Yeah. So stepping into your confidence, let's start there. Then let's talk about making sales sexy. So stepping into your confidence, there's something, an exercise I work through with all my clients where we basically identify what I call their confidence markers. So what is this? These are five to eight things that you need to do on a weekly basis that make you feel like your most confident self. So first, again, awareness is step number one. So for me, what makes me feel confident? Working out five days a week, drinking my four, three to four liters of water a day, eating, you know, 80, 20. So having really good, healthy meals, but also enjoying a piece of cake or chocolate or a glass of wine if my body wants one or I'm craving one. It is making sure that I'm staying on top of my skincare so my skin looks great. Because again, face of the company, guys, you got to look good, right? So my, when, my, when my skin looks good and I'm glowing, I feel radiant and I feel extremely confident. It is making sure that I'm staying on top of my routines. It is making sure that I'm writing my to-do list every single morning and staying on top of my word of what I said I would deliver to clients on time. And it is making sure that I have a degree of socialization within my calendar so I'm not a hermit behind my computer, right? Boom. Those are seven things that I I consider non-negotiable and a confidence marker in my in my weekly routine. So for me, it's understanding what brings you the most confidence and then setting boundaries around the things that detract from you doing those things to make you more confident. So for example, I workshop this with a client yesterday. She's been going out drinking a lot lately. London, UK just opened up and she's been going out a ton because they've been in lockdown for a year and a half. But as a result, she's been feeling super low energy, super down, not confident. She hasn't been going to the gym because she's been hung over. Excuse me, her skin's dull. She's just not showing up as her best higher self. So I said, okay, we know what the root cause of this is. So what what are you going to do to change it? What's the boundary you're going to set? She's like, well, I really only want to drink one or two times a week. I'm like, great. So listen, no one else is going to set that boundary except for yourself. So if you're saying, I don't feel good because I'm going out and drinking and this would make me feel good instead so that I can do all the things that make me feel confident, you need to set and exercise those boundaries. Now, what I will say, you setting boundaries will piss a lot of people off. I'm not going to lie. I have lost friends. I have lost family members. I have lost partners, significant others, because What I've learned is that people who don't value your boundaries and don't respect you enough to understand why you're setting them, they will never understand it. And it's not your responsibility to have to explain to them why you need to set them. So I will say you will probably lose or shed some connections that probably you already know maybe weren't working out. Um, But I can tell you the level of um, weight and freedom you'll feel from releasing those connections that are um, inhibiting your confidence from growing and expanding, um, you will really start to feel a whole new level of confidence. Now let's bring that into sales. So making sales sexy, that's my MO. I 
breaks my heart when I when I work with people. And unfortunately, it's almost it's 90% of my clients who think to your point, like you said, sales is icky. So, you know, it's sleazy. Um, you know, they've had experiences where people are just pushing them into products or services that aren't aligned or they don't need because they want the the dollar signs in their in their bank account, right? When it comes to making sales sexy, again, confidence is 1A. I'm, see, I'm sure you guys are seeing a theme, but confidence is 1A in everything that you do. 1B to that is, again, understanding your value and your worth. When you understand your value and your worth and you're on a, on a consultation or a sales call with someone. And for example, I had someone who said to me a few weeks ago, Jacqueline, who do you think you are for charging it was the the contract was $28,000 for six months. Who do you think you are charging $28,000 for six months? I was like, well, I know what I bring to the table. So let me explain. I said, these are all the things that go into a consulting contract with me. This is how much I pay out of pocket to ensure that I'm bringing in partners who are complementary to my brain and what I do to give you the best results in client experience. These are the number of hours and work and deliverables that I put into your contract, not including your conference call. This is the support of my team and the two team members you have, you know, underneath you and basically detail to a T why I'm priced the way I am. And I was like, and quite frankly, this is actually severely underpriced because based off of all the support, my hourly rate's only about $65 and their jaw just dropped. And they were like, what? I was like, yes, my team, we over deliver and our contracts are priced under what they actually should be because I'm not in the business of ripping people off. I believe wholeheartedly in what I'm able to do for your business. I know that I'll be able to transform you into becoming a million dollar woman and being on that path. And I know that me and my team are the right people to do so. And her jaw just dropped because I knew my numbers inside and out. I knew to a teen, I wasn't selling her. I wasn't pitching to her. I was just saying, hey, here's my cards. Again, here's all the value that I bring to the table. If you don't see value in that, I'm fine with that. We're not a good fit. And that's the biggest thing, right? When you are able to confidently sit in a chair and not pitch, not sell, but know the value that you bring to a table and be able to articulate that in such a way that it feels empowering and confidence inspiring versus sleazy or, you know, just icky in terms of them trying to shove you into a service you don't want and letting the person on the other side of the call make an informed decision with no pressure. Like, how sexy is that? The fact that you're like, you know what? Take some time to think about it. I'll send you all the details so you can sit back, have a glass of wine, talk to your partner and see if this is a good fit. If you, you know, if you think this is a good fit, great, I'm here. If not, totally understand. And I can tell you immediately the walls drop, guys, because they're like, oh my gosh, she's not selling me. She's not forcing me. But more importantly, at the same time, it's establishing connection. Like I don't get on a conference or a, a consultation call with someone unless I know to a degree who they are, what they do, again, what they do in their spare time who they are as a person, what lights them up, what they're passionate about. Because when you get on a sales call and when you're talking with someone, you should have a pre-established relationship with that person. If it's not a pre-established relationship, it's a pre-established connection of someone you know, of how you guys are able to draw conclusions on the call. Connection is everything. Relationship is everything. And at the end of the day, if you are able to prioritize connections and relationships, And just genuinely caring about the people you want to work with and the work that you do. And again, making an impact over an income and then being able to communicate the value that you bring in a way that is tailored to them. And you're able to, again, talk about their wants, needs, pains, and gains and speak directly to their soul and what they're struggling with and say, we'd love to work with you. No pressure. You let me know if and when you're ready. Like that is the way sales should be done, not the way these sales coaches, and I'm saying air quotes if you were to see me right now, teach you how to sell in the online space. Because I can tell you it is based, they root it in fear, they root it in pressure. And I can tell you for someone who's managed $700 million, I did not manage that amount of money by pressuring people, 
or instilling the fear of God in their eyes that if they didn't do this, they were not going to be successful. It's the exact opposite. And no one will tell you that in the online space. I love that. Oh, if only everybody was like that. (laughs) I'm on a mission to change that to be determined. (laughs) Amazing. All right. So you talked a little bit about the experience, the value that you bring to your clients. So I'd love to dive into kind of what you think are the important aspects to a client experience that provides that white glove luxury experience. Yeah. So my biggest, the thing that I always say is treat your clients like you would want to be treated, then add 50%. That's like my rule of thumb. Um, So for me, what are the attributes or the pieces that give that white glove client experience? So first and foremost, it is transparency to the point where you feel like a broken record for, for communicating so much, right? You need to communicate right off the bat the boundaries that you, both you and the client are instilling to create a healthy relationship. A lot of people think that this is like dictating or it's going to create a negative client experience. It's the exact opposite. Bad client experience exists because there's a lack of communication, expectation, or result. Can we just, can we hear that again? Bad client experience exists because there's a lack of communication, expectation, or result. So if you're looking to create a white glove luxury client experience, you need to make sure that you're communicating first and foremost. Secondly, it's infusing luxury into everything that you do. Like champagne is a part of my brand because like I actually am a wine collector and I love champagne and it's literally who I am. Like I drink champagne on a Tuesday afternoon just because I feel like having a glass. Like I think that these types of luxury, you know, touch points need to be infused. So how are you creating custom um, welcome kits, proposals, brochures, you know, your custom client experience and elevated client experience starts before they're even a client. It's how you're nurturing them. It's how you're customizing the the proposal and the brochure to ensure that they feel seen, value, heard, and supported. It's how you're onboarding them. You know, how are you sending them a customized welcome gift? Like one of my clients, Lauren in Australia, she loves hot chocolate. Every time I send her a welcome gift when she resigns, you bet there's hot chocolate and now she's pregnant. So the latest one was a little baby robe with like her initials. But like, how are you customizing things? So it's not just like a blank box and a blank card that's getting delivered to a client doorstep. How are you, again, making sure that your clients feel seen and supported? So do you send for me, like I send recap emails after every single call I do. I want my clients to know exactly what we talked about, what's in the works, and what they need to work on. Um, It's at the end of the year. Do you send handwritten Christmas cards to every single person that invested in you and your business, whether or not they spent $29 or $100,000? You need to. I spend a solid week writing Christmas cards and buying customized Christmas gifts for all of my clients because that's extremely important to me. It's also making sure that, again, if you are saying that you are a luxury client experience or your white glove, you actually show up that way, right? So what's your response time? Do you stay true to that? When you make a promise to a client, are you actually delivering it? These are the things that really make the difference between someone who has a near 100% retention rate and glowing client reviews versus someone who is extremely high churn on their book of business because they're not able to retain clients. I could talk about client experience forever, but I think a lot of people think of the fancy stuff. They think of the champagne and the welcome gifts and all of these amazing things, which, yeah, they are important if you want to um, color yourself as a luxury client experience. However, for me, luxury client experiences start with how you treat your clients. And if you are not treating them that way and setting those expectations and boundaries and communicating in a way where they can come to you whether or not it's for a business question or they're crying over a boy who left them. Listen, that is the true marker of a a solid client experience. I have not had one client who has left or is still not a client where we've become best friends by the end of our contract, where they call Mm -hmm. me crying over boys or, you know, something happens with their family and I'm one of the first people they think of reaching out to, right? 
that's a marker of an exceptional client experience where they trust you with more than just their business and they see you both as a mentor, consultant, coach, strategic advisor, whatever you want to call yourself, and more importantly, a friend. Like that is the difference. I love that because that so resonates with me. (laughs) I think we need so much more of that in the online space to make it more personalized, right? To like... (sighs) Yeah, it doesn't have to be transactional. Like I think the online – this is what drives me insane. Like guys, coming from corporate, I guys, like I'm literally (laughs) sitting back right now like grabbing the chair because it's it's like the wild, wild west out here. Like Mm -hmm. the things I've seen, I'm like, my goodness. Like do you not understand what it takes to run a business? But yeah, you know, business is not supposed to be transactional. Business is built on relationships. And Mm -hmm. I think the online space – for whatever reason, missed that memo. So Absolutely. yeah, we are speaking the same language, girl. I love that. That was like one of my core values is like just going above and beyond and being there for my clients, regardless of whether it's business or personal or whatnot, they can come to me and we can talk about anything and just being that person that's like their right hand in those times of needs. Totally. I love that. All right. So let's talk about what you have to support your community. Yes. So a few ways that I work with the ambitious woman to help them shatter the glass ceiling and become a million dollar woman. The first one is million dollar woman workspace or million dollar workspace for short. Um, This is my membership, my community for the ambitious woman who's looking to shatter the glass ceiling and become a million dollar woman. So this has a big group of women in it. Um, Everyone from, again, entrepreneurs and every type of entrepreneur imaginable, photographers, coaches, consultants, OBMs, strategists, graphic designers, you name it, it's very diverse, all the way to women in corporate, women in finance who are shattering the glass ceiling from a corporate perspective. And the workspace, I'm not even going to lie, it's my baby. It's like my labor of love. Um, It is basically everything I looked for in the online space but couldn't find. Again, I was sick of seeing support in the online space cost thousands of dollars. And I, I don't think it's fair that people were not able to get the support and attention that they needed to grow and scale their businesses and their careers without investing tens of thousands of dollars. So I started that. Um, it's super fun because it's a combination of business, work, and personal. Uh, we do quarterly wine tastings. There's workouts and wellness seminars, as well as quarterly business academy, monthly master classes, multiple expert guest speakers. And there's also fireside wine and coffee chats with me where I sit, no agenda, carte blanche, ask me whatever you want. And it turns into like basically open consulting and coaching sessions uh, for whoever's on the call. So it's my way to really give back to the community um, and to support women who may not be in a financial position to make those large investments um, that they need into their business. And then in terms of support from a one-on-one capacity, I do offer strategic advisory and consulting for the ambitious woman, again, for entrepreneurs and for women who are in corporate and in finance. Um, We are booked out until Q2 2022. So if there's any interest in working on a one-on-one capacity, reach out to your girl because uh, spots sometimes do open up. Again, life always happens, but uh, I always like to make sure people who are looking for support are able uh, are able to get it. Absolutely. All right. So if they want to connect with you, which I absolutely think they should, you are going to love what she shares, um, but where can they connect with you online? Where do you hang yes. out the most? So Instagram, first and foremost, okay, I always have to preface this, which means it's time for me to change the darn name. So guys, my Instagram (laughs) handle is Lil Relks, L-I-L-R-E-L-K-S, only because I'm the youngest Relky daughter of three, and Lil Relks has been around since I've been like 13 years old when Instagram first came out, and I don't have the heart to change it. So eventually that might be something else, but Lil Rocks is where you can find me. Uh, the jwmethod.com is my website. And then if you're looking for the workspace, super easy. It's workspace.thejwmethod.com. And that will take you to um, our portal where you're able to see more information surrounding that. So Instagram is definitely best. Send me a DM. I love to connect with other ambitious women. If there's anything that resonates with you guys today, I would absolutely love to hear it. But stay tuned if that name is eventually going to change. (laughs) (laughs) 
I love it. <laughs> and that's what, I, that's what I mean. Everyone that I talk to is like, I love it. Like, it's so unique. It's so fun. Like, it's not just another name or like whatever. So I don't know. I flip flop back. I flip flop back in, t- in between like changing it or not. So I'm, I'm very, very torn about it. <laughs> Take your time to make that decision. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much, Jack, for sharing your incredible story, for being such a powerhouse inspiration of what is actually possible for us and for sharing your advice on how we can shatter our own class ceilings and become a million dollar woman or more as well. (laughs) Of course. Thank you so much for having me again. I, I know I can talk a lot, so I hope you guys found value in that. Again, thank you so much for having me on as well. And If you have any questions, anyone who's listening, I am a transparent open book um, and I'm more than happy to support you in whatever way that I can. Amazing. Thank you. I'm Jessica and thanks for tuning in today to Love Unplugged, the podcast. If there are any questions or topics you'd love answered on the show, head on over to www.projectloveco.com and share your request with me. If you haven't yet, go to iTunes and subscribe, rate, and review this podcast and share it with a loved one. Your feedback means the world to me and the community we've created is what fuels our discussions here. After all, this is all for you. Join me next time for another Unplugged Conversation.